John Holmes. BBC Radio Nottingham. Hit the road, Jack, from Ray Charles. Rami, you've chosen one of my favourite singers of all time. Have I? Yes. Uh, well, um, my son sings it beautifully, and it reminds me of the holidays we've had with our family. And in the car, the family sang Hit the Road, Jack, and, mm-hmm. our, and our son went on full volume. Mm-hmm. And even now, when we have family gatherings, um, it's, it's wonderful to sing together. It's so bonding and so wonderful. You forget the world when you're singing in a group. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that's why I've chosen it, it's a nice because one. it's a family song. Yeah. Let's do the twist of that. <laughs> yes. I mean, just actually, before I introduce you properly, singing's in your family, isn't it? I mean, your father was a famous Indian singer. Yes, my father started singing when radio first started in India in 1936, and he sang continuously till the year 2000. And then when television was introduced in India, he was one of the first singers on the television in 1954 till the year 2000 when he retired, and uh, he had over 300 records. My goodness. Yes. So his name? Vidyanath Seth. Vidyanath Seth, uh, he would be in England. And uh, I think my father's generation uh, knew him, but not the current generations. Oh, lovely. Right, let's let's, let's do it. Let's let's introduce you properly then. Your business card reads, business card reads, dinner speak and raconteur. (laughs) But, you know, you're hiding a your light under a bushel here because uh, you've also been a GP. Yes. Yeah, where was that? Uh, actually, I started in Allerton in North Nottinghamshire in 1969, the year we got married. And we, were, uh, we lived in Rufford Park, beautiful part of the county, for mm. 10 years and uh, had a lovely time. And it was a lovely place to bring up children. And uh, they grew up there, but when they were teenagers, they wanted the lights of Nottingham. Oh, right. And then we moved to uh, Woolerton, and uh, I found a practice in Bestwood and a job in City Hospital as a surgeon. And uh, then I got, was appointed a tutor at Queen's Medical Centre uh, to organise continuing medical education for general practitioners in the county. And I did three jobs all my life, and oh. I loved them. Yes. Right, right we'll, 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 we'll talk more about that. And also your work with Rotary as well. I mean, a big cheese in Rotary. Do that later. Because okay. the next piece of music um, is Beethoven's Fair Elise. Yes, um, it reminds me uh, of my first film I saw as a child, an Indian film called Barsat, a Bollywood film. Mm-hmm. And the hero actually played the tune on a violin. And that's and I loved it when I first heard it. And I thought it was an Indian music till I came to England. And then I realized it was written by Beethoven years ago as a, as a piano a piano piece. And uh, I've loved it ever since. Reminds me of the earliest music I've ever liked, for Elise. For Elise. Vladimir Ashkenazi playing as well. Absolutely delightful. Beethoven wrote it. And Vlad- I was going to say Vladimir. Um, Rami Seth chose it. Thank you, Rami. Thank you. Now, let's, let's go right back then. Um, born in India. Well, John, I have a very colourful family background, which is so hard to beat. If you were writing fiction, you couldn't invent it. I had three grandfathers. Mm-hmm. Three? Two, two were murdered and one was stabbed. And my grandmother ran away with the piano teacher. Well, let me explain. My father's father volunteered in the Great War and he served in Mesopotamia. And after the war, when he came back to India, he must have shell shock as we can look back and understand. And he went in search of the Almighty into the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, he was found murdered, we never knew why. And then my mother's uh, father uh, married a young Anglo-Indian lady uh, my, uh, who uh, my, my mother's grandfather was John Alexander Williams from Wales who had gone to India and his granddaughter became orphan and my mother's father married this Anglo-Indian lady whom neither the Indians wanted nor the English wanted because she was a uh, mixed race and my grandfather was an older man and she was a younger girl and uh, but he was a wealthy man And in quick succession, he had three children, and my mother was the youngest. And after that, he engaged piano lessons for her. And she ran away with the piano teacher. So my mother was left uh, without a mother again. 
So my grandfather went to marry again, and he took his family and his wedding entourage and, and some jewels, a dowry and that sort of thing. And during the night he was poisoned, and all the jewels disappeared. And then my mother was adopted by the only grandfather I knew who had graduated uh, uh, in medicine from the London Hospital, mm -hmm. spent 10 years in London, and went back to India in 1910. And he was the best friend of my grandfather who had been murdered. And he adopted the children and brought my mother up and put her through medical school. So my mother was a doctor, which was unusual for an Indian lady. Uh, she graduated in 1941. So she had a pretty mixed up upbringing. Did it affect her? Well, it did. She missed her mother all her life. Uh, and, and she made sure that her children, and I'm the eldest of uh, three, that her children were brought up in a secure, safe, very loving environment. And my mother and father were fortunate. They had a charmed upbringing, not short of anything at all, but with a lot of love and a lot of security around me. They made sure what they didn't have and what my father didn't have and mother didn't have, they made sure that the children had in plenty. So this was it, were you in Delhi, was it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, actually, I was born in Lahore. Mm -hmm. So my... Uh, third grandfather. He's getting confused. Yes. Yes, on, go on. yes yeah. the third grandfather who had adopted my mother yes. and the only grandfather, uh, father I knew, uh, he was in Lahore. Right. And at the time of partition, he was waiting for a train to go to Delhi. And, and, uh, and a Muslim chap came and stabbed him in the abdomen. And he had to be rushed back to the hospital for emergency surgery because there were Hindu Muslim riots in those days. So there you are. That explains my three grandfathers and one grandmother. <laughs> yes, it does but, sort of. Did, did you, 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 but you had. Let, let's sort of make this more positive. You had a happy upbringing. Very very happy upbringing. Yeah. A privileged uh, yeah. upbringing. Why, my, why do you mean privileged? Why was it privileged? Well, because my parents were reasonably well off, and they sent me to the best schools in India. I went to a uh, two public schools, actually. And uh, I was a, a popular boy straight away because the music teachers in both the schools knew my father. Right. So on the first day, they persuaded my father to sing to the school. So my father gave an hour's, uh, an hour-long concert to in mm. both schools. Gosh. So every boy in the school knew me. So I became popular on my day one in school. And all the teachers knew me. And... Uh, and, and the music teacher in my school said, Seth, you'll be in the school choir. And I was only nine years old, little, and I was in the front row, and I sang loudly. And when the assembly finished, he came up to me and said, Seth, tomorrow, stand in the back row. <laughs> so I, I stood in the back row and sang even louder. And he came up to me and after the assembly, put his arm around my shoulder and said, Seth, have you considered playing drums? And do you know I've played drums ever since because I can't sing. Although I'm in a choir now. I was going to say you're not, not in a hospital's <laughs> choir. I'm, I'm a president oh, of see. the choir, <laughs> but I sing in uh, music for everyone in Bulletin. That's right. another choir. But they have they would accept anybody. <laughs> but I love the singing side of it. Yes. Well, we, we're still trying to transfer your dad's singing. Yes. It was, it was originally on a 78, wasn't it? Yeah, because it was a seventy-eight been, RPM. Yes. Yeah, we've been listening to it, so we do, we're still trying to transfer it because seventy-eight RPM to a. Well, anyway, doesn't matter. We're, we're working on it. <laughs> now, um, so, in contrast, isn't your dad? It's Gene Vincent. Where does Gene Vincent fit into this? Um, well, that's um, B. Bobalula. Well, B. Bobalula, a, a very close friend of mine in school, uh, whom I still see after sixty years together, uh, he sang in the music competition in school. And and he won the prize, and every time I see him, we sing it together. <laughs> so uh, we were very we were a group of four close friends, and we still see each other. Four of us, uh, two of them are in India, one is in the USA, and I'm here in England. But we still meet uh, every now and then and sing "Be Babalula" together. So it's for old time sake. Gene Vincent and "Be Babalulu, BBC Radio Nottingham with me, John Holmes, and with my guest Rami Seth who, um, as I say, on his business card quite simply says, raconteur and after-dinner speaker. But as you're finding, there's more to Rami than you ever thought. Um, and you, you've got more surprises coming. But let's, let's deal with, why, why did the family leave, 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 leave India? Why did that all come about? Well, I mean, your dad was doing remarkably well in India, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was. But uh, we had a home and property in Lahore. 
And um, in June, I remember that my mother took us to the rooftop, uh, their flat-roofed homes, and there were fires all around the horizon. They were burning and and writing, and my mother said, no, we must go to Delhi, must leave Lahore and go to Delhi. And I think nine million people migrated at that time, in 1947. So my uh, parents hired a truck and so sent... Lahore's Pakistan, is that right? Yeah, now Pakistan, yeah, that's right. yes. yes now, but at yeah. that time, it was undivided India. Right. And uh, they sent the furniture ahead, and my mother insisted that you take. we took a train and went to Delhi. And my father knew people in Delhi because mm-hmm. he had sung from All India Radio in Delhi as well. And and we had some relations, so we came to Delhi. And my mother got a job straight away in a maternity hospital, which came with accommodation. And do you know, John, my first Christmas present, when I was five at that time, very unexpected, was from the matron of the hospital, who was an English lady. And she called me over on Christmas Day and gave me a little bag, and I took it from her. Uh, we, in India, we weren't brought up to say please and thank you, like in British society, which is the most polite society in the world. Mm. And I took that bag and I ran home. And when I opened it, it had glass marbles. And I'd never seen a glass marble in my life. So beautiful with vivid colors in it, oranges, greens, blues, yellows. And I was the owner of crown jewels. It's one of the happiest moments in my life, my first Christmas present. And, you know, I'd never even thank that lady, and I feel bad about it. I'm sure she's no longer alive, but uh, well, she's wherever you are, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> that, that was crown jewels for me, my oh. first marbles. I'd never seen a marble before. Per- perfection. They are magic, aren't they? Yes. I mean, being, yes. being spellbound when I was a child. <laughs> yes. So why did, why did the family move to, to Britain? Or does it, was it you who moved to Britain? No, no, only I moved to Britain. Uh, b- because my grandfather had graduated from England and my mother was a doctor. And, and in those days, uh, if you had a postgraduate qualification and training in England, you were established for life because British qualifications were respected mm-hmm. and still are as one of the best in the world. So I came to England to train as a surgeon with every intention of going back. Uh, When I came here uh, over 50 years ago, 85% of the doctors went back to India. Uh, Only 15% stayed, but nobody had statistics in those days. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge shortage of doctors uh, in the National Health Service. And uh, most of the junior doctors, about 50% of junior doctors in the hospitals were from the Asian subcontinent. Uh, so I came here to train and I got my surgical qualifications. Uh, but in those days, to become a consultant surgeon, you had to be white and you had to be from a local medical college. But right? things have changed now. You had to be white. You had to be white in those days because even the white doctors with surgical qualifications weren't guaranteed consultant jobs. There were so few. There were so few. Uh, I knew senior registrars who had been junior doctors for 10 years or more and still couldn't find a consultant's job. You see, a place like uh, Nottingham would have had four surgeons. Now we have 50 consultant surgeons. Mm -hmm. Many more jobs created and many more specialties, but not in those days. So you became a GP? Well, uh, GP gave me a status and income and my beautiful wife uh, whom, with whom I um, fell in love and got married. And that's the reason we decided to stay on in England. So how did you meet your beautiful wife? Yeah. Well, in my youth, 80% of the junior doctors married nurses and the rest barmaids. That's what they said, because we didn't come across any other young ladies. <laughs> so so it was Dr. Meat Nurse in Warwick Hospital, and, and I invited her to the hospital ball, and that was the start. Oh. And, and we had, uh, we've had a wonderful, wonderful life, and uh, wonderful children and grandchildren. And grandchildren blessed with four, yeah. yes. And uh, you, you set up a GP in where was it again? Uh, I started in Allerton. Um, I, I started with the locum. 
and uh, job was advertised for a locum, so I applied. And when I finished the locum, they offered me partnership. And I saw my partners uh, in a well-organized practice uh, in a beautiful part of the county, although mm -hmm. it, our patients were mostly minors, but they were so respectful and so good and so genuinely hardworking people. And, and I liked it. Uh, and mm -hmm. Rufford Park was a lovely place to live in. Have you been to Rufford? I have indeed, yes. It's, it's, it's yeah. very beautiful. And, uh, and we had a great time. Mm -hmm. And then I contacted... Uh, uh, well, local there. hospitals. We'll stop there on the story because I want to get Hey Jude by the Beatles in before the news. Yes. Why Hey Jude? Well, my wife and I are both Beatle fans and Elvis fans, and um, I chose Hey Jude because it has got a slightly Indian tinge to the tune. Oh. I think it's Indian influence in Hey Jude, but it's in memory of Beatles and the music. Hey Jude! Hey. The Beatles, the next choice of my guest, Rami Seth. So, happy times as a GP in Ollerton. Yes. What was the main complaint? Back pains from minors or...? <laughs> what was the main complaint? Um, I think back injuries yeah. with mining, yes. Mm. But can I tell you a story, a true story? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, one Saturday afternoon, um, my wife called me. We used to do our own emergency weekends and 48-hour cover. She said, come to the phone quickly. This man sounds very frightened. So I went there, picked up the phone, and this chap said, Doctor, come quickly, my wife is bleeding. I said, where is she bleeding from? He said, I have no idea, come quickly. And I knew I had to go straight away. So I went straight away, and, and, and on the street he was shaking and sweating and said, upstairs to the right. So I went upstairs to the right, and there was a lady in the front bedroom in her mid-40s in some discomfort. So I examined her. I said, lady, you're pregnant. She said, I can't be. How do you know? I said, well, I'm a doctor. She said, are you sure? I said, yes. <laughs> she said, when is it due? I said, any moment now. <laughs> she said, it can't be. I put on a bit of weight. I felt a bit tired. But I've never had a baby. I've been married for 27 years. And do you know? She said, are you sure? I said, yes. And do you know that news spread on, on, on that street? And within five minutes, there was a court, and there was a pram, and there were booties, and there were nappies, and there were rattles and toys. Anything a baby could conceivably require arrived in that bedroom. Somebody even boiled some water. And to this day, I do not know why. Yeah. Somebody brought me a pile of newspapers. I didn't want to read them either. Mm -hmm. And do you know, a five pounds and half an ounce baby boy was born. And it's not that small. No. And I've never seen a human being so happy in all my life as she held this unexpected gift in her arms, looked into my eyes, held my hand and said, thank you, doctor, what is your name? And I'd heard women naming their babies after the midwives or doctors who deliver them. So I took a deep breath and I said, Rami, not Seth. She said, I'll call him Tony. <laughs> she said, I hope you understand. I've always wanted a Tony. I had two Bajrigas who were Tony. And if I have another one, I'll call him whatever your name is. And after that, she went on the pill. So she preferred calling a baby after a Bajriga than you? <laughs> well, she always wanted a Tony. But I can quite understand. A chap called Raminath Wilson in the Ollerton Comprehensive won't have an easy time. <laughs> Yeah. We might talk further on that, on that subject in a moment. Now, we've managed to transfer. We won't play all of it because it's a bit of a scratchy old 78, but we've got your dad's voice. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So wonderful. just talk me into this. Well, my dad, uh, one of the first songs that I remember of my dad uh, is this Gina Heto Mojmeji, which translated means that you're on this earth for a short time, but make the most of it. Fill your life with laughter and love. And all the troubles that come, that you face, that life will throw at you, smile through them and face them. But don't forget the laughter and love in your life. That's what the song is about. तो मौज में जी दुख 
सुख का है जग में देरा धूप छाओ का पल पल फेरा जैसे जल में कमल रहे हैं वैसे ही रह ले तू भी जीना है तू मौज में जी है जिंदगी जिंदा दिली जीना है तू मौज में जी That's your dad. Yes. I'm very proud. I'm of him. very proud. Uh, would, I mean, in 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 uh, Asian terms, he's world famous, wasn't he? In Asian terms, but but India is so big, people exactly. don't realize you yeah. can put whole of Western Europe into the map of India. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that? No. The area of Western Europe is 1.02 million square miles. Area of India is 1.32 million square miles. Wow. Rami Seth is my guest, and I love. By the way, I love your braces. Oh, thank you very much. You know, I usually wear them when I'm doing a magic show. You do magic yeah. shows well, as I well. I did two magic shows last week. One for the Probus Club of uh, Ruddington, and one for the oh, I can't remember which other club it was, but Probus clubs often invite me. <laughs> uh, well, just to say that they've got all the symbols of the, of the playing cards. Yes, on them. yes, yeah, yes, very good, yes, very, yes. Most, most, most colourful. Yes. Um, yes, uh, Christine Aguilera is next. Mm. Why is that? Well, I have a beautiful daughter who is a musician. She lives in Long Eaton with two beautiful grandchildren and a lo- very loving husband. And she now runs uh, rockabillies for mothers and babies singing groups. Yeah. And before that, she had her own group, and she was the lead singer and saxophonist and clarinet, played the clarinet. And she had the, when she was married. At a wedding, she sang Lady Marmalade. You know, you couldn't have a better, loving, more beautiful daughter. And and this song will always remind me of my daughter singing at her own wedding, in her wedding dress, Lady Marmalade. Um, I've got Grammy Zaff with me. And uh, you, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, at one point, no people, only white people will become surgeons. Well, no, no. Um, Consultant surgeons consultant or consultant surgeons. physicians. Right, okay. You could go in other specialties which were less popular, like psychiatry, accident and emergency, even ophthalmology, um, healthcare of the elderly, right. and you can find a consultancy. There was less competition, but not in general surgery and general medicine. But you yeah. also alluded to the fact of you know what would a, what would a, a chap called Rami? How would he get on if he was in Ollerton? <laughs> so yes. did you did you have a problem when you came over like that? Uh, no, not really. But once uh, you you find your own level in society and your own circle and your own friends, uh, th- there was some. I think the society has changed in Britain a lot mm. in the last fifty years. Yes, of course there were problems in the early days. Um, like I still remember seeing signs fifty years ago in London: "No Irish, no blacks." Yes. Uh, for vacancies, and uh, I once remember in a pub. That, now this is very rare. Majority of the time is excellent, but very rare. I went and asked for a, a pint of bitter in a pub, and the chap actually in front of me got a pint glass out and poured the overspill beer from a tray into the glass no, and served it. No. Uh, yeah, but but that's an exception, and that's fifty years ago. Um, that's <laughs> I'm surprised I even talked about it because I thought I had erased it from my oh, memory. Well, I prompted yes, that. Yes, um, yes. But I, I did want to get on to the, one of your one of your lecture topics, as it says here. Sounds very um, very um, profound, isn't it? Lecture topic is no one speaks English like an Indian. What's well, all that about? Well, that's very true. You know, the English who learn in India is a little different from the English in England, especially the pronunciation. And it's very confusing for a person who's learnt English abroad and comes to England. For example, if somebody says, I'm not feeling myself today, well, that could be very rude. Uh, you, say, what, what, uh, you probably say, well, it's good, you shouldn't. <laughs> uh, or the word oversight, it could mean observation or lack of it. Flammable and inflammable means the same. Valuable and invaluable means the same. The word fast could refer to something going at speed or something that is stuck. This screws fast. And if I went to somebody's house and knocked at the door, and if his wife said, he's not up yet, or if she said, he's not down yet, it meant the same thing. And when a farmer says that his cow's in calf, 
he actually means that there is a calf in the cow. So that's the confusion in the English language that one has to relearn uh, when you come to England. When you've re relearned it pretty well, whatever. <laughs> well, it, it's a very interesting language, but uh, it's, it's a long lecture. But mo it might surprise you to know mm -hmm. that one of the theories is that English actually came out of many languages. It's a living language, but basically it's Latin and Greek. But Latin and Greek originated from India, from Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. So the commonest words in the world, like mother and father, are Sanskrit words. If you look up the dictionary, it will tell you. Mother, mata, mater, madre. In Sanskrit, it is mata. Pita in Sanskrit is pater and um, uh, padre and father. And brother, brother, sister, um, uh, uh, swasor, duhita, daughter, uh, yes, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, basically are Sanskrit words. So a lot came out of India long before the rest of the world was civilized and literate. Uh, I'm talking about 3,000 years plus. Well said. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, so that's the English language, yes. I've got um, Pauline from Colix texted in. She says, what an interesting guest you have this morning. I had the pleasure of assisting him to conduct my friend's funeral. He's so charming. Oh, so you do that as well? Well, yes. Uh, I, I, my wife actually suggested that I should conduct funerals because she thought I'll do them well after we attended a funeral that was not very, very oh, right. well done. So I went on a residential course and got a diploma in civil funeral celebrancy. And I have done a few funerals, yes. Goldfinger next. <laughs> yes. Now, Goldfinger is, is the little boy in me, the adventure in me. Uh, I'm a James Bond fan, mm -hmm. always have been, and a Shirley Bassey fan. And um, and with, uh, with Bond, it's your imagination and world travel. And I've been so fortunate with my travels. My, uh, my father bought a motor car in 1948, which was not very common in Delhi in those days. And with that, we went to Simla, Missouri, Nanital, uh, Srinagar in the Himalayas, and we traveled and had long holidays. So we had lovely childhood. And even went to Sri Lanka with a school uh, group. But after coming to England, with the British passport, it's so easy to travel everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been very fortunate. I've seen this beautiful planet of ours. It's such a lovely, peaceful place with so much for everybody to share, for everybody's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed. And and uh, it's it breaks my heart when I see conflict in this world. There's no need for it. We can all live peacefully and enjoy what we have in this short life that we have here. Goldfinger, Shelley Bassey, and uh, that's the next uh, choice of Rami Seth. And what else do you like to say about that then? Well, uh, I'd like to say how fortunate I am to be invited on cruise liners to give lectures. Oh. And my wife and I are fortunate. Uh, we've been with the, all the three queens of Cunard yeah. a few times, and with Fred Olson, with Saga, with All Leisure, um, and, and many other lines. And uh, we've also seen the Arctic and the Antarctic and East and West, so we are very, very fortunate. Yeah that we've been doing that for a while. So your wife's Jenny. Yes. Not, you're, she's the mother of your two children. Yes. And now you're a proud grandfather of four. I My am indeed. Uh, it's a, uh, I've been, uh, I'm one of the luckiest men on this planet, actually, John. Um, I had cancer of my kidney in 2004. And I worked in urology at the city hospital, so I knew what I had. And I asked one of my colleagues to take my kidney out, and he did. And a year later, I had the cancer return in four places in my liver and in my inferior vena cava, which is the main vein in the body. And I knew it was inoperable in those days. And my colleagues in Nottingham agreed, and they sent me for a second opinion to Birmingham liver unit, and they said it was inoperable, and that was 2005. So I came back, and I gave a party. I had over 200 people there, mm -hmm. and I said, look, I'm going in about three months, some of you will come to my funeral and say nice things. I want to hear them. <laughs> and, and, you know, they said very nice things, and there was not a dry eye in the house. And then uh, Professor Patel, oncology professor, was appointed, and uh, 
he said, well, let's try an injection of interferon three times a week, and it shrank my cancers. Then he sent me to St. James's Hospital in Leeds, where I found a young surgeon who took seven hours and removed the cancers from her liver and the vena cava. And then a year later, I had cancer come back in my right lung, and at the city hospital, they took it out through keyhole surgery because it was picked up early. And then in 2008, it came in my left lung. And that was removed through keyhole surgery. And then I've been cancer-free for six and a half years, mm -hmm. traveling the world, enjoying life, my family. And then my follow-up scan three weeks ago. Sadly, the cancer has come back in two ribs and both my lungs and the pleura. And it's my first week on chemotherapy. So it's my seventh day today. And uh, fortunately, I'm tolerating it reasonably well. And I'm going to fight it and try and beat it again. Um, so my advice to anybody suffering from cancer, never give up. The world is full of people who have proved doctors wrong. And we are so fortunate in these islands to have the National Health Service. Because when you really need it, it's there. And it is there for you, free of any expense at the time of delivery. Of course, it's such a vast organization that we are always criticizing it. But when you really need it and when there is an emergency, it's second to none in the world. If, if anyone in this country breaks a leg or needs 10 pints of blood or needs a drug costing 850 pounds to dissolve a clot, or need a complicated abdominal operation in an, in an emergency, all they have to do is dial 999. And they're likely to get anything they need. And in hospitals, which are amongst the best in the world, we should be grateful for what we have in the National Health Service in this country. And I think we don't appreciate it as much as it deserves. Of course it can be improved. Of course there is so much that can be done better but we must not overlook the service we get from the National Health Service. And that's why I chose my record of St. James's Infirmary, which is Louis Armstrong, whom, uh, whose voice and trumpet I've loved ever since I can remember. A wonderful man with a, such a melodious and unique voice that I used to copy him sometimes. I don't think I can do it now, but... When I go down to St. James's in Oh, I can't do it now, but I could do better at one time. St. James Infirmary from Louis Armstrong. And Rami Seth does a good impersonation of Louis Armstrong. I've got a few <laughs> more texts coming in. And this one says, I remember growing up in Ollerton when Dr. Seth was a GP. Very respected. And people still remember him today, says Bill in Ollerton. Oh, how about that? How kind. Uh, your guest daughter also does speech, sign and song group, which immensely helps my daughter who has Down syndrome. Oh. We are truly grateful. Thank you for the gift his daughter brings to the children of Nottinghamshire, says Jason in Long Eaton. Bless her. Oh, Ramy, thanks for coming in. Thank you. So, Rami Seth, thank you. Paul Roby, we welcome. Had, uh, th thank you. Oh, sorry, oh goodness, we... careful. <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> it was me, yes. <laughs> we had uh, a shortage of dentists in this golden year. We were okay with doctors, but, uh, <laughs> but not so much with dentists. There was a record Christmas spending spree in Nottinghamshire shopping centres and I think you've already mentioned, haven't you, the panto, not for the first time at Nottingham's Theatre Royal, was Cinderella. Which production of that, you may well ask. Barry Howard was one of the stars. Oh, I was there. Uh, I thought you Barry might be. Howard, when, yes. When weren't you there, John? <laughs> Goodness gracious. And uh, we're starting to feel ferociously festive as well with uh, favourites from the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. Glenn Miller, our featured artist this week. A passion for Nottinghamshire life. BBC Radio Nottingham.